Well, it's a wonderful time to be here tonight. I've got one thing to say to you as we begin. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. Repeat after me. Thank God it's Friday. Say it like you mean it. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. Let's get a march going. Thank God it's Friday. 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 It's Good Friday. Let's praise Jesus. I have in my hand a gift. It is apple juice, hand pressed, in case you were wondering, from our farm out in the sticks beyond the end of the Metropolitan Line. Yes, let's hear some stuff. So from foreign climes I bring you English apple juice. Thank you. Brother. <laughs> I told you he's a crazy Anglican vicar. I told you. Have a seat. Well, I think you've got the title for my sermon tonight. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. And if you are observant tonight, you will hear not only, I believe, the Word of God, but many points that all begin with F. Okay? So if you're taking notes or if you have one of those encyclopedic brains that can remember every single point, every point I have for you tonight begins with the letter F. A lady walked into a doctor's office and she had this frog on her head. And the doctor said, what's, what's the matter? What can I help with? And the frog said, I've got this woman stuck to my bottom. <laughs> the frog said, there is this woman stuck to my bottom. The story comes from a lady. She says this. The other day, I went up to a local Christian bookshop and I saw a honk if you love Jesus bumper sticker. Now, I was feeling particularly excited that day because I'd just come from a thrilling choir performance. So I brought that sticker and I put it onto my bumper. And boy, I am glad that I did. What an uplifting experience followed. I was stopped at the red light of a busy intersection. I was just lost in thought about the Lord and about how good he is. Now, I didn't notice that the light had changed. And it's a good thing that somebody else loves Jesus because if he hadn't honked, I would never have known. I just found out that lots of people love Jesus. And while I was sitting there, the guy started behind, he started looking crazy and mad and angry. But then he leaned out of his window and he shouted, for the love of God, go, go, go. What an exuberant cheerleader he was for Jesus. Everyone started beeping their horns and honking. And I just leaned out of my window and I started waving and smiling at all of those loving people. And I even honked my horn as well a few times to share in the love. Now there must have been somebody from a resort in Florida or some hot part of the world because I heard him yelling something about a sunny beach. But I saw another guy who was waving his hand in a funny way and it only had one finger stuck up in the air. Now I had my teenage grandson in the back of the car with me and I, I said, what does it mean? And he said, oh well granny, I think it's something like a Hawaiian good luck sign or something like that. Well, I'd never met anybody from Hawaii so I leaned out of the window and I gave him that good luck sign back again. Now a couple of people were so caught up in the joy of the moment that they got out of their cars and they started walking to me. I bet they wanted to pray or ask what church I attended. But then I noticed that the light had changed. And so I waved to all of my sisters and brothers and I was grinning and I drove on in the other direction. 
Now I noticed I was the only car that got through the lights before they changed back to red again. And I felt kind of sad that they had to leave. And I had to leave them after all the love that we had shared there in the street. So I slowed down the car one more time and I rolled down the window and I leaned out and I gave them all that Hawaiian good luck sign one more time as I drove away. I thank the Lord for such wonderful folks. <laughs> I think we can safely say she did not grow up in South London. <laughs> We are going to focus on one word tonight, but we're going to unpack it. Jesus spoke seven words from the cross, seven phrases, and we are going to unpack those together tonight. We're going to memorize them. We're going to think about them tonight. We're going to take them with us, unpacking the meaning of, of Good Friday. He speaks at least seven times from the cross in the different gospels. I'm going to read you a few verses from Luke, the end of Luke's gospel. Sigmund Freud, the psychologist, said that when you are pushed to your visceral limit, that's the edge of what you can cope with, the real you comes out. When you are pushed to the end of your visceral limit, the real you comes out. It's about the only true thing that Sigmund Freud said. But when Jesus was pushed to his visceral limit on that Good Friday on the cross, the real him comes out. Amen. Amen. Let's read. If you have your Bibles, turn them over, please, and open up to Luke chapter 23. That's the end of Luke, and then turn back a page. <laughs> and the account of the crucifixion, I'm going to pick it up from verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the other criminals, one to his right and another to his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots, or as I explained to my children last night, playing Yahtzee. And the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, he saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. And the soldiers came up, and they mocked him, and they offered him wine vinegar. And they said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our sins deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, today you will be, be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining and the curtained temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he'd said this, he breathed his last the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. Surely this was a righteous man. The first word from the cross speaks of forgiveness. The first word from the cross speaks of forgiveness and the purpose of the cross. We thank God it is Friday because of forgiveness, that purpose of the cross. It is love's purpose that we see here on Good Friday. It gives us an insight into the Trinity. Jesus calls the Father. There is no break in this perfect unity. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In this moment, his communication, there is no sense in which God the Father is in any way pulled away at this point. He is intimately, he is passionately involved in the cross, in this action of reconciliation between God and man and forgiveness. God is 100% involved. Sometimes people have this understanding or this idea that God the Father just sent somebody. 
who was not involved in the process, God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit intimately, lovingly connected in every aspect of the purpose of the cross because forgiveness was the purpose for the cross. It was love's purpose, forgiveness. God revealed to us as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, love incarnate in community. You need personhood to love. And in the eternal being of God, there is love. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even as he is paying this huge price for sin, the huge price not just of physical suffering, but what theologians call propitiation, that means to take the wrath or the punishment or the penalty which our wrong deeds deserved and to lay it upon his shoulders. He is holding that in his very self in this moment and still in the midst of this excruciating, wrath-bearing moment, he is thinking and saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In fact, that's the very purpose for why he is on the cross. It's not a distraction to him. The forgiveness of those people sitting around him is not a distraction from the main job in town, like that whole dying on the cross thing. No, this is the purpose. The forgiveness is love's purpose. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's not just the people crucifying him. He's saying that to you and I tonight, wherever we are. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That is what this cross is all about. Love's purpose is forgiveness. The cross is the forgiveness moment. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit together making this reconciliation possible. Justice and mercy upheld at the same time. Punishment and forgiveness held in his very being and then offered out to you and I. Justice and mercy together. Even as Jesus suffers, he has mercy and compassion on the perpetrators. And that includes you and I. The scriptures say that the church overcomes by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Do any of you have a story? Do you have a testimony? Do you have a story of how that forgiveness went from being theoretical to personal? It went from being a story that other people told to a description of your own journey. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There is a moment when we gaze upon the reality of the cross where suddenly we realize that Jesus' love and his purpose was not just for those people gathered around him who sent him there, but you and I, and our neighbors and our friends and this generation. Father, forgive them, love's purpose. That word, that first word on the cross is about forgiveness. A second word that, that, that Christians meditate upon at this time of year, a second word from the cross speaks not just of forgiveness, but of a future. A future, the second word, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. A future, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23 verse 34. Love doesn't just have a purpose, it has a hope and it has eternal life. We see this insight again into the heart of God and his purpose in coming. Luke earlier described that Jesus came to seek and save those that were lost. And here he is hanging, dying upon that cross, hearing the mockery and the obscenity and the violence of heart by those passing. And Jesus is not self-centered. He is not concentrating on his intellectual and emotional energy solely on this moment of dying. No. He is so full of love. He is so motivated by the salvation of souls that even as he is dying, hanging, struggling for breath upon this cross, he is turning and he is promising to one of those on his left, today you will be with me in paradise. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. This is why Jesus is dying so that you and I can be with him for forever, for a future. I'm a huge fan of of Twitter, not because of everything that's in it, but because I'm a communicator. And it comes out of every pore. I tweet, I Instagram, I Facebook, I even WhatsApp. <laughs> There's a WhatsApp group of about 45 people across the world who are praying for us tonight. 
And they're saying, I'm praying for you. And I'm getting these little live tweets. I'm praying for you. So if you're a tweeter, you are allowed to tweet and live tweet this sermon. I'm at Missional Frog. And you can do that. And I'm suggesting a hashtag for tonight. Hashtag FCI TGI Friday. <laughs> This is why Jesus is dying, so that we can be with him in paradise. Notice how little the thief on the cross does in this moment. He's got no time to do any good deeds to earn his salvation. He has run out of time. A friend of mine was sharing the good news with somebody in their 80s and said to them, would you like to make a response to Jesus tonight? And the guy says, You're, I'm still waiting. And he says, well, it doesn't look like you've got that much time. If you're waiting to the 12th hour, it's about 11.56. <laughs> You've got four minutes left. Is it not time for you to make a decision? Well, the thief on the cross was in that moment. He was in the 11th hour. What are we doing waiting for the 11th hour to turn our hearts over to God? Are we going to wait until our hands are pinned to the side? Are we going to wait till we get killed in an underground accident or hit running by a bus or another bit of appalling driving as somebody gets taken out? Are we going to wait for these accidents and incidents and horrors that grip the world. Are we going to wait or are we going to respond? He has no time to do good deeds. Sometimes people have this understanding that Christianity is about doing good deeds to change the world. It's not just about making bad people good. It's about making dead people alive. And the thief on the cross as he faces his death begins to realize and recognize the fundamental miracle of the gospel of grace. In that moment he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom in these moments. And he says, today, now, today, as your breath leaves your body, today you will be with me in paradise. This is not something that we wait until the 11th hour. This is the future, the destiny, love's hope, love's purpose is eternal life offered to you and I, but not because of anything that we have done. This thief reminds us of grace. This thief destroys a false gospel of works and of good deeds. They say that one of the greatest heresies of the early church was called Pelagianism. It was this idea that you earned your salvation through good works. And do you know where they thought that Pelagius came from? The British Isles. And he moved down to North Africa where Augustine of Hippo was sharing the gospel and he was overseeing the African church. And Augustine of Hippo turned around and he rebuked Pelagius and he said, you have not understood what the gospel is. The thief on the cross here, in this last word from the cross, he knew what it was. If Pelagianism was true, his time had run out. You can't feed the poor when both your hands are pinned to a wooden stake. You know there are going to be people around here who will be thrilled when they see the church doing good things for, for those in need. When we do the things that we love to do, like educate those who cannot who cannot read, like bend down and, and, and minister to those who are hurting. When we give people self-esteem and put them into jobs and we give them the arts and we begin to let, let them realize that they can, they can be loved again. And there'll be politicians, local and national, who turn to us and say, this is what Christianity is all about. But we have to resist that temptation. This false gospel that has come from these British Isles and has been reigning here for 2,000 years. The thief on the cross understood God's future. The gift of grace. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus turns and he sees that thief. Are you a thief? I remember the first thing I ever stole as a child. It was a sticker. From a sticker shop on the King's Road. <laughs> I was a thief. I was mortified. It held on my heart for many, many times. And after a little while, I remember feeling so convicted that I went back into that shop and I, I dropped a one-pound coin on the floor and left again. <laughs> What's your story? Do you have a story like that, thief? 
I remember a time my parents went their separate way when I was about three. They were officially divorced when I was about six. And I remember a time as a, as a six-year-old asking the Lord Jesus to come and be Lord of my life. I remember exactly where I was standing. I was age six. As a six, I was at the foot of my mother's bed. And she said, have you asked the Lord Jesus to be your personal savior? I think she'd gone to a, a church service and felt that she needed to get it all sorted. And I said, no, not really. She said, why didn't you do it now? I said, okay. And I remember saying, Lord Jesus, come and be Lord of my life. I don't know what I was expecting to happen, but not what did happen. Seemingly absolutely nothing. <laughs> I prayed that prayer and it seemed to me that nothing happened. But do you know what? That's the only thing I remember from age six of the events in my life. I can't really remember many other things. My parents went their different ways. I went off to boarding school. I was there when I was eight. By the time I was 13, I was so badly bullied that I was sent to hospital twice from bullying at the hands of people who are meant to be my friends. I had a roommate at the time in this boarding school and he remembers me as a 13, 14 year old being so miserable that I considered taking my own life. I was beginning to wonder, is it worth living at all as I was being beaten up on a nightly basis. But in the midst of this, I was seeking after God. Going along to a Christian union on a Friday night. It's one of the reasons that I'm so keen on Christian unions, whether they be at university. I hear we have somebody here who has been involved in a CU in Accra. <laughs> Pastor Shadrach involved in that in the University of Ghana many years ago. Or in your school. It was where I went to pursue my own relationship with God and see if God had a purpose for my life. I remember the moment when... I went away one summer holiday and I was in a, a school and they were, our church and some other networks had rented that school for the week and I remember that opportunity as a 14 year old at the end of a year of appalling bullying and somebody said that, that this is real. I remember them reading through 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Now, I'd been in a very traditional background where people said the creed. I'd been in the choir. I'd done choir boy of the year competitions. The year before me, Alan Jones won. That just puts you in kind of context. <laughs> so I knew these hymns. I could sing the Nunc Dimittis in Latin. I could do the Magnificat in various different languages. But I wasn't sure if it was true. <laughs> it's all very well understanding these things and seeing them as part of the culture but it is actually is it true in school the scientists were telling me that that the world created itself and in the bible i was thinking maybe that wasn't the case in school and my friends around me were telling me that you could do whatever you wanted and yet my conscience was telling me that i was a far far away from holiness around me my friends were taking inordinate amounts of drugs and they were telling me that, that the highs that they had were special, but in my heart I knew that there was a happiness that I was made for and a purpose and a destiny. God had placed, as Augustine says, eternity in our hearts. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. That's what it says. I had a restless heart that was chasing after God. That was my story. Do you have a restless heart? Do you find rest? in the one who made you. I think that thief on the cross had a restless heart. He was seeking after things and it got him in trouble. He wanted the, the pizzazz of getting into trouble and running the gauntlet. I remember in the seven years that we were ministering around the corner, the worst two things that, that we were worried about in terms of all the work we were doing with the youth was wind and the summer evenings. Wind, I have no idea. Still haven't got to the bottom of that. I think just when it was windy, people just were a bit crazy. <laughs> and things were just flying around. We used to call them urban confetti. That's the plastic bag stuck in the trees. <laughs> but it was in the summer when the kids were out of school and the nights were going on till 10, 10.30 at night and these kids were just wandering the streets and they were just looking for belonging and happiness and purpose. They were restless. They were stealing things just for the, for the adrenaline rush of, of running away from the police. They were doing acts of violence just so that they belonged. 
A thief on the cross, he was probably one of those kinds of people. And in the end, in those scenarios, it got him into trouble and he was there finding himself at the 11th hour. So for me as a 14-year-old, though I had a restless heart, I suddenly realized for the first time that particularly for me, when it said, I believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which I'd said so many times as a choir boy, I suddenly began to realize that the third person of Trinity was not just the last line of the creed, but God himself inviting us into relationship. And he says, I want to come and make you a temple where I dwell. God is saying, I want to involve you in my purposes. I don't want you hands off there as a good or a bad person. Jesus gets up close and personal to that thief and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. You don't just get into heaven, you go with Christ into glory. The personal relationship that you make with him now, that lasts forever. Oscar Wilde says, fall in love with yourself, it is the beginning of a lifelong relationship. But he was wrong. If you want a lifelong relationship, that's going to end. But an eternal relationship begins in Jesus Christ. You can start a many lives long relationship. Oscar Wilde set his eyes too low. And I remember bending down on my knees as that 14 year old boy and asking God to come into my life and turn me around. And it was the beginning of an eternal relationship. I had nothing of merit to offer him. The thief on the cross. And Jesus turns around to him and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. The gospel of grace that is there in that second word of the cross. And the third word from the cross moves into this. And it says, the third F is family. In John 19, 26, Jesus is on the cross and he sees around him the three women and Mary crying at his feet that we saw so beautifully and movingly demonstrated for us tonight. Mary's cry. I just want to say thank you for that. And Jesus, as he is hanged there on the cross, he suddenly realizes that Mary needs a family. And John, who is further off and the women are close, he calls him and he says, woman, here is your son. And to John, here is your mother. He restores relationship. He makes family where there was none. The church has always been the place where real and lasting family is meant to exist and live. The one who had no son was given another. John, who had a heart filled with compassion, was given another mother to take into his home. And from that moment onwards, there was family and there was care and there was nurture. Love carries with it responsibilities and community. Family comes. In one of those seven words from the cross, doesn't that strike you as extraordinary? We think of the cross as a moment of theological depth, but do we think of it at the moment when new families are made? When new communities are grasped and created out of nothing. Where people from all sides of the world come together and they become one people. I've brought three people with me tonight. From far-flung places. From Amersham and Uganda. <laughs> go Uganda and go Amersham. Why don't you stand? You guys stand where you are. That's Mel. And Raymond and Brenda over here. Do you sit down. The people sitting next to you and around you, they were once not your family, but now they are because you have the same heavenly father and the same brother in Jesus Christ. That's... Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing at a distance, he said this. We know the disciples had deserted him at Gethsemane and Peter had denied him. Who are the eyewitnesses to the cross? Who are the eyewitnesses? Tell me. It's not rhetorical. This is Ghanaian. You can tell me. Who are the eyewitnesses to the cross? The women. The four women. 
And even John has deserted him and gone to the edges. Who's up close and personal? Who sees the blood coming down his side? Who sees the tears? Who hears his rasping breath? Who is up close and personal as the eyewitnesses to the resurrection down through the generations? Who was there to listen to the words of the cross so that we can listen to them tonight? Who was there? These four women, I want to tell you, there has never been a time when Christianity has been sexist. Jesus chose the four witnesses to the gospel, to the resurrection, to the crucifixion, the heart of our Christian faith, and here it was, the four women around the cross. Amen. They are specific. We're told Mary, Mary's sister, Cleopas, Mary Magdalene, we're given their names and their addresses and their phone numbers. We can call them up for an eyewitness account. In the time that this was written, if you wanted to know, you could do it. They didn't have a Twitter handle, but they had a name and an address, and, and you could follow up who they were. This is, a, this is a hallmark of Christianity. It is testable and reliable and verifiable in history. This is not some fantasy, faith-filled, phony thing. This is fact. Attestable, verifiable, witnesses, open to scrutiny. People say to you, you say, yes, come and have a look. Come and have a look at the eyewitness testimonies. In fact, we've got four gospels and four women. We have eight sets of eyes looking at this moment of the cross and telling it. If you've ever been in a car accident, how many times do you get eight sets of eyes? Hardly ever. Here we have it. But it is an utterly forlorn and a tragic scene. The women in Jesus' life are watching him die. His closest friend stands in desolation, distraught, watching the brutal end, not just of him, but of all of their hopes and their dreams. Perhaps Mary remembered the words of Simeon who held that eight-day-old Jesus. This child is destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. In that moment, the soul is pierced by the sword of grief and agony and anguish. Jesus had worked in the carpentry shop many times and he had felt the splinter of wood in his fingers drawing blood. Mary was used to that in what she grew up with, but here a sword pierces her soul and she tastes the grief that had been prophesied on the eighth day of this baby boy. Mary watches her own son being crucified. We're given an insight to the closest of earthly relationships, Jesus, his mother, and his best friend. And as he dies for the sins of the world, bearing the monumental burden of being the mediator between God and man, wiping away sin, taking the wrath of God in the spiritual and emotional and physical agony, at his visceral limit, you see the real him coming out. And he is loving his family and he's putting people together for forever. The pure love is revealed Something profound here about Christian relationship is modeled. How she feels does matter to him. How you feel tonight does matter to Jesus. He is not distant and on the edge. How you feel does matter to him. The church is the family for believers. And this unselfish love of the Son of God as he suffers is a pattern for us, for our families and for our church family. We are meant to feel and love, to weep with those who weep, to rejoice with those who rejoice. Many of those who have lost mothers or children from this word on the cross can resonate. It is unbearably tender, but allow the Son of God speaking from the cross to soften your heart for the love of God and the love that God has for you. And the pain of this loss his love washes over those who will come to him. In the midst of family life or pain, or pain of loneliness, his love washes over those. Will you come to him? Will you come to him? Will you allow him to put you back together again? Fourthly, the fourth word, forsaken, F. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It comes in Mark chapter 15, verse 34. This is love's extremity forsaken. 
Now, to understand this next word from the cross, we're not going to do a massive Bible study, but what I will say is this. It is Psalm 22. In the days that, that Jesus was talking about, if you wanted to quote an entire psalm, you would often quote the first line. We do it the same. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. We know if somebody was to say amazing grace, we may know all of the hymn and all of the lyrics and we would, we would accept the same. Jesus here is quoting the first line of Psalm 22 and we are meant to recognize that the entirety of Psalm 22 is included in this quote. And if you read Psalm 22, it will blow your mind what is going on there. If you have your Bible, open it. Open Psalm 22. Don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. Psalm 22 will blow your mind. And Jesus is quoting it here. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? But it carries on. Verse 7, all who see me mock me. They hurl insults and shake their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Verse 12, bulls surround me, strong bulls encircle me, roaring lions tearing their prey. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. It's exactly what happens in a crucifixion. You are pulled, your bones are pulled out of their joints. My heart is turned to wax and has melted away within me. You suffer heart constriction and you often die from a heart attack and it is turned like wax in front of you. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. We know from the accounts of those four witnesses that they say, I thirst. Dogs have surrounded me. In those days they used to say that dogs was an analogy for Gentiles. He is surrounded by Gentiles. A band of evil men have encircled me. They've pierced my hands and feet. I can count all of my bones. Jesus was naked upon the cross. People stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. But you are not far off. And then verse 22 to the end, he knows the resurrection is coming. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the congregation, I will praise you. There is praise after this suffering. And from you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation will bow down before him. In this moment of the cross, he is not saying just that God has forsaken him. He is including the entire content of this prophetic psalm written hundreds of years before crucifixion was even invented. People didn't understand. He pierced my hands and feet. Crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. The Romans didn't invent crucifixion. They learned it from the Greeks. The Greeks didn't invent crucifixion. They learned it from the Persians. The Persians invented it. And they passed down their skills from one generation to the other. Alexander the Great, when he saw it, he adopted it. It was an appalling way to die. And Jesus cries out from the cross, quoting this psalm, shouting to all the world, what is happening now has already been written about in detail before it ever happened. It was not just a hopeless cry. It was a cry of God's perfect plan and purpose. This is what I came to do. The word from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is a moment not just of dereliction, but of hope and of promise and of resurrection. We here, representing all the nations of the earth, will praise him, are the fulfillment of this prophecy. We have seen and experienced the cross. We have benefited from its riches. And now we are the ones with praise in the great assembly. A fifth word is this, I am thirsty. The physical facts. I know physical isn't exactly, technically speaking, an F, but it'll do. <laughs> I am thirsty. It's incredibly practical. A man was meant to show some love to his wife so he went into a shop and he said you know it's Valentine's Day I want to buy something really really nice and the shopkeeper says here this beautiful bottle of perfume she'll love that he said how much is it she said 
well, it's 50 pounds. He's like, ah, I want something a little bit, a little bit less than that. Show me something else. So <clears throat> she says, okay, well, there's, there's a, a little eau de toilette here. It's very, very small, but a little dab behind the ears. It's beautiful. And um, how much is this, he said. She said, oh, that's about 30 pounds. And he went, oh, I'm not sure. He said, look, I don't think you really understand. What I'm looking for is something really cheap. She said, oh, that's easy. She picks up a mirror and puts it in front of his face. <laughs> when the mirror goes up in front of Jesus' face, when he is thirsty, what do we see? We don't see somebody rich. We don't see somebody cheap. We see somebody precious. Pouring out the most costly oil that he has for you and I. He's not seeing what loose change he has in his pocket to give us a tip. Oh, I'm so sorry, I can't even give you 10% today. Well, £3.50 do. He's saying, I see you, you are precious, you are worth it all. I'm going to pour out my life for you so that my very tongue is stuck to the roof of my mouth in this, in this agony, I am thirsty. The physical facts, we approach the blood and guts of the cross. The burden of the cross was primarily spiritual, taking the shame and the guilt and the burden and the punishment, but it was also physical. A physical pain is not the primary reality, but it is a reality. And so we hear the cry of a real, practical, crucified man, I thirst. Romans considered crucifixion to be the most shameful, the most painful, the most horrible of all ways of dying. The Roman statesman Cicero said this of crucifixion, it is the most cruel and disgusting penalty. It is the most extreme penalty, he wrote somewhere else. The Jewish historian Josephus witnessed so many crucifixions, said this, it is the most wretched of deaths. The Roman jurist Julius Paulus cru listed crucifixion in the first place as the worst of all capital punishments, listing it at head of death by burning, death by beheading, and death by wild beasts. And from Seneca we have this quotation, one of the unique descriptions of crucifixion in literature outside the Bible. He writes this, Can anybody be found who would prefer wasting away in pain Dying limb by limb, or letting his life out drop by drop, rather than expiring once for all. Can any man be found willing to be fastened to the accursed tree? Long, sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly wounds on shoulders and chest, and drawing the breath of life amid long drawn out agony. He would have many excuses for dying even before mounting the cross. This is what the secular commentators said about crucifixion. Nobody could be found who could do such a thing. And Jesus said, I can be found. I will do such a thing. I will take the penalty so that you and I could have eternal life. Such a man can be found. Such a man has not just been found. He volunteered. He offered himself willingly. He was not coerced or pushed or persuaded or manipulated into going to the cross. He did it as a free act of love for you and I. Have you loved a child? Would you go to a cross for them? Maybe not. But Jesus went to the cross for you. This practicality of love as Jesus demonstrates it so that you can know without the shadow of a hint, of a thought, of a doubt, does Jesus love me? Yes, I do, he said. Yes, I do. Does God understand? Yes. Does God care? Yes. These are the questions that suffering humanity incessantly asks. God doesn't know. God doesn't care. God doesn't understand my situation. Yes, he does. Does he understand betrayal at a trumped up charges? Yes, he does. Does he understand what it's like to be betrayed by your best friends? Yes, he does. Does he understand what it's like to be left at a distance and denied? Yes, he does. Does he understand what it's like to be stripped down and naked and ashamed for all to see? Yes, he does. Does he understand what it is to be mocked and scorned and cruelly taught? Yes, he does. Does he understand what it's like to be walking down in shame, carrying a burden upon his back that is breaking his body? Yes, he does. Does he understand what it's like to have the skin taken off his back in a moment of extreme agony? Yes, he does. 
Does he understand what it's like to be gasping for breath? Does he understand what it's like to have his bones pinned to a wooden cross? Yes, he does. Does God care? Does God understand? Yes, he does. Thank God it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday. The sixth word is just one word. In English, it's three words. It is finished. In Greek, it is one. Teterestai. It is finished. It's one word. One word. And it's all done. Love's finality. Love's finality. It's finished. And it's all done. There was a man who had a problem with self-esteem and assurance. And after a while, he was so tired of being bossed about by his wife that he went to a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said to him, you really do need to build up this self-esteem. He gave him a book on assertiveness, which he read on the way home. By the time he got home, he finished the book and he reached his house. The man stormed up to the house. He walked in up to his wife, he pointed a finger in his, her face and he said, from now on, I want you to know that I am the man of this house. My word is law. I want you to prepare me a gourmet meal tonight. And when I'm finished with my meal tonight, I expect a sumptuous dessert afterwards. And then, after dinner, you're going to draw me a bath so that I can relax. And after I've finished my bath, guess who's going to dress me and comb my hair? The funeral director, she said. <laughs> but there is a final cry it is finished, Jesus says. Jesus says it is finished. He has completed his work. He's seen it through to completion to the very end. I'm great at starting things. I'm okay at getting them done. They don't all get finished. But Jesus finished the great work that he set out to do. He brought it to his completion, to its finality. He said, Tetarestai, it is done, it is finished, it is completed, it has ended, I've done it. It is done, job done, job done. Thank God it's Friday. He has done all that is necessary. And so his seventh word from the cross, the final one, is full. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. <sighs> he says the last word and then he breathes the last breath. It's done. He knew the scriptures inside out and he's actually quoting again from Psalms 35, 31 verse 5 which says, into your hands I commit my spirit. But like the first word, the last word still has father in it. They say that when a child is born, the first syllable to come out of most children's mouths is a b, a b, a b. The first form of communication, a b, a b, a b. And when a child is born, the first person that they're aware of as a different person themselves is usually the father. Because at this stage, the mother is just the food delivery system still. <laughs> and only later on do they realize that she is another person than themselves. So the first person they become aware of is the father. The first syllable that passes their mouths is a ba. And the last syllable to pass through his lips is a ba. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. From the beginning of his life, from the first breath to the final breath. When a child is born, and then the cry. And Jesus cries out, and then the breath goes. 
and the whole job is done. His entire life has been lived with purpose and finality and perfection for you and for me. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is full. It is final with the Father. What a pattern for us in life and death. He entrusts himself entirely to the will and the purpose of his Father. He knows that he can trust the Father to raise him from the grave. He knows he can trust the Father to make good on his promises in three, four, five, six, seven hundred years worth of scripture. He knows that he can trust the Father who he created the world with in dynamic unity, the wisdom at the beginning of the foundation of the world, he knows that he can trust the one that he has been part of and knowing and loving for all of eternity to bring the whole of human history into completion where you and I get to be surrounded by glory and love and worship and fellowship and those of us who are our family now will be together with him forever. What a pattern for us in his life and his death. To entrust ourselves completely to the hand of the Father. Those facing death. After the cross. When Nero was crucifying persecuted Christians. He sometimes went around the floors of the places where he had had them. Torn limb from limb by wild beasts and burnt on the stake. And in his fury he saw that many of them had smiles upon their faces. Because as martyrs they had gone to experience the sweetness of fellowship, even in their pain and their agony. Jesus did that for us. He lays down his life and it says the temple curtain was torn in two. Now this isn't just like a neck curtain, like an extra large doily hung up here that we're talking about. It is ripped in half from top to bottom so that we know that this is God's initiative, ripping the difference between God and man so that each and every one of us could have real relationship and fellowship with God. It says the veils in the most holy place were 60 feet long and 30 feet wide. They were the thickness of a palm of a hand. Just the material alone was the same as that. It was in 72 squares joined together. They were so heavy that sometimes they said it took 300 priests at a time to raise them up and put them in their place. Jesus' death has broken down that barrier. He has opened up the way to enter the holy place, not just once, but to live there, to dwell there forever in the presence of God. I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Nothing, neither height nor depth nor any other thing. Neither angel nor demon, nothing will separate you from the love of God and from this place in the most holy place, which is why Hebrews says, let us enter with confidence the most holy place. Let us enter with confidence. It is there, it is done, it is finished. And we can stride through into the presence of God, into the very throne room and place our petitions at the feet of our Father. And he will answer our prayers. That last word from the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The work of bringing an end to the separation between God and man. It is done. It is complete. It is finished. This is love's completion. This is the breath. Those seven words from the cross. Forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. A future Today you will be with me in paradise. A family, woman, here is your son. Forsaken but fulfilled of that prophecy. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The facts of physical things of the thirst. And it is finished and now I go to the Father. It is perfect. This is the point of the cross. Thank God. It is Friday. Now I think we need to respond, don't you? To the word of God, if it has dwelt in our hearts richly, let's respond. Let's stand where we are right now. Let's open up our hearts to that work of the Spirit right now. Let's just call upon the Spirit's work in our heart right now. Open up your heart right now to that finished work of God, that breath that was breathed out 
on the cross now breathes in to you. Breathe in the presence of God tonight. He has a future for you. Today you'll be with me in paradise. If there's anybody here tonight and you think you have an uncertain future, you've heard about this Good Friday, make yourself known to us. Come up to the front. Come to this side here if you would like to. Commit your life to Jesus Christ, either for the first time or as a recommitment. Come here on this side and we will, we will restore you and help you pray and come back to the Lord Jesus. If that's you now, just why don't you come right here now. We'll just wait for you, give you the chance. There's a few more of you. Do feel free if you want to come down from the top. Thank you. The ministry team, some of the elders will come pray with you as well, I think. If you have a life to recommit to the Lord, take this time. I think some of you are still waiting for something else to be done. But Jesus is saying to you tonight, it is finished, it is done. There's nothing more that needs to be done. For some of you, I think you're waiting for a breakthrough in finances or you're waiting for a breakthrough in your relationship life. If only I could get the husband or the wife that I need or the child that I'm longing for, then I could work into the purposes of God. And Jesus is saying, it is finished, it is done. I've given everything. There's nothing more that you can bring, nothing more that you can give. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray for these two right now. Restore a relationship with them tonight, we pray. Fill them with your spirit. Breathe your breath of life into them tonight.